Hey everyone, we are still waiting for some folks to get dialed in. Uh, welcome to the webinar event. Very excited that you're here. Uh, if you want to sit tight for just a moment or two uh, to give uh, others a chance to get logged in, we'll get started shortly. If you just joined us, um, we will get started in, what do you think, Jason, about maybe the next 30 seconds here? Sure, yeah. Yeah, That's okay. It. Just wanna get, give people a chance to get uh, logged in here. Um, I know it's lunchtime and out there in Silicon Valley, uh, everyone's schedule is probably packed, so we'll give it another 20 seconds and then we'll get going. Cool. All right, I think we're gonna get started here. Um, welcome everybody to the power of investing to change the world. Uh, I'm super excited uh, that you're joining us uh, because I know how impactful and inspiring uh, this webinar is gonna be for all of us. Um, and I just wanna say up front that this is not a product pitch, okay? Uh, rather, uh, Jason and I really wanna help us understand and, and rethink uh, how we view investing and how it actually has historically shaped the world around us that we, we live in today and how it's gonna continue to do that uh, into the future. So um, I think that when most people think about investing, uh, they think about increasing uh, their net worth, they think about accomplishing their goals, putting their kids through college, retirement, and all those things are, are awesome and noble, noble things. But uh, we might not always realize what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so fund companies like Eventide um, that believe in biblical investing are, are there to help investors like us uh, align our dollars with our values. And that's not a concept that every uh, mutual fund company practices. Uh, so Eventide and others are set apart in that way. And uh, we're going to kind of take a look today about how this concept actually advances uh, human flourishing in the world. So um, before we kick it off here, some of you re remember Jason, actually, if you attended our last uh, uh, webinar presentation titled Timeless Truths of Investing. That was a great presentation, a great webinar. Um, the content of that one actually was really great uh, kind of establishing a framework or foundation to build upon uh, for this one uh, and just to kind of understand some concepts uh, a little bit better. But if you missed it, don't worry uh, because you're in very good hands. Jason has the amazing uh, capability of sharing complex truths in very pal uh, palatable ways is what I've, that's what I've taken away. A um, couple of housekeeping items and then I'll pass it to Jason. This is a 30 minute presentation but we will have a segment for Q&A at the end, I think about 15 minutes. So uh, if you have questions, uh, jot them down, or if you are afraid you're gonna forget or you just wanna pop them into the comments section, you can do that. And then when we get to the end, I'll go ahead and field those questions 
and we'll talk about them. So um, I think that's it. Without further ado, I want to pass it off to Jason and let him take us through uh, this amazing presentation called The Power of Investing to Change the World. Jason Meyer. Thanks so much, Matt. And a warm hello to all of you who are joining in on the other, other side of the screen uh, for a topic that I really, really love and I think that you're going to be uh, really interested in. So we're talking about the power to change the world. Before I dive in, I'll just give a brief introduction. It's always good to know who you're listening to. So I'm Jason, and I am a managing partner at a company called Eventide. We are a Boston-based mutual funds company that specializes in values-based investing. My day-to-day -day work is in an area we call advocacy, which is where I speak to audiences and really advocate that they consider their beliefs and values whenever they're making investment decisions. And with that, we'll go ahead and formally begin. So how do we change the world? Well, I think one of the best places to start is by first kind of sweeping away some common misconceptions. So the power to change the world is fundamentally not found in politicians. Uh, so hopefully this takes some pressure off of you during this uh, election season. Politicians, they kind of, you know, they have their fingers up to the wind. They're trying to read which way the winds are blowing and they operate more or less according to that paradigm. Politicians are often uh, a servant to the will of the people and the winds of society. And it's difficult for them to go against that. The power to change the world is also not found, and this may even be more surprising, in autonomous individuals, heroic, great individuals working in isolation. Uh, history tends to remember these great people, but a close examination of history reveals many other forces at play. So what I've just laid out is a case that has been brilliantly made by this person, James Davison Hunter, who is a sociologist on change theory at the University of Virginia. And he puts these thoughts into an excellent book, which I highly recommend. You can see it uh, listed there, To Change the World. So how do we change the world? Well, let me read you a quote from his book. This capacity to change the world is not evenly distributed in a society, but is concentrated in certain institutions. That's the key certain institutions, and among certain leadership groups who have a lopsided access to the means of cultural production. And what I'm gonna to try to convince you of is that investing is one of these certain institutions with disproportionate power to change the world. And as we will see all throughout history, capital and the movement of capital has profoundly shaped the world. So, I'm gonna kick it off with my first example here, and I'm gonna ask you a question. So you'll see this appear on your screen as a poll. So who is this famous explorer <clears throat> on the screen? If you kinda of go back to your, your middle school days of history uh, and try to remember, who is this person? Let's see if you can guess this. Who had one of the most famous voyages of all time. Getting a few people responding here. Thank you very much. I'll leave it open here for just a second. All right, I'm gonna call, call it done here. Share the results, which you'll see on the screen. So 80% of the audience got it right. This is uh, Christopher Columbus. All the people on the list were very famous explorers. So. It's kind of a tough, tough question there. So don't feel any shame if you, if you got that wrong. So this person, Columbus, of course, we, we think we know this story, right? He, he sailed the ocean blue in 1492. What many of us don't know, however, is the investing story behind Columbus's voyage. So in that day, sailing on the Atlantic was an incredibly expensive proposition and no one person had the capital to finance it. And so what Columbus actually had to do is traipse all around Europe and try to drum up investor support for this journey. He started in his home country of Italy and they said, no way. Next, he went to Portugal, the world leader in shipping. No way. He goes to France, no way. England, no way. And he finally receives his yes in Spain. Many of us know the story of Ferdinand and Isabella there. By the way, this was indeed a investor-led uh, effort. 
He negotiated a very sophisticated investing deal with his investors where he gained the rights to 10% of the revenues for this trading route that he would establish and an option to invest one eighth in any commercial business that was established in lands that he would claim on behalf of Spain. So what, what was the world change uh, story here? Well, let me ask you some questions. Why does Central America and South America speak Spanish? Why is the major religion of that whole territory Roman Catholic? Why do they eat tortillas and not croissants? The answer to all of these questions is investors. Because Spain backed Columbus's expedition, he sailed under the Spanish flag and carried Spanish interests into the territory that he would discover. This is why uh, he brought with him Spanish culture, religion, and language. It could have gone a different way. If England, for example, had decided to back Columbus, that whole territory would speak English. Uh, the, the major religion would be Anglican after the Church of England, and it would look like British society from a cultural perspective. It was investors who decided these things. Uh, and these world impacts were not probably things they were thinking about at the time. Let me give you another example. This is a map of the of the trading routes of the British India Company and the Dutch East India Company established in the years 1600 and 1602 respectively. Historians believe that these are the two first truly modern corporations as we think about them today. Like Columbus's journey, they were incredibly expensive and so they had to raise investor support. They did this through the sale of stocks and bonds to ordinary investors. In fact, we get the world's first stock exchange in Amsterdam where investors could now trade these shares that they purchased on an open market in order to gain liquidity uh, from their investments. Did these two companies change the world? You better believe it. India becomes a colony of Britain as a result of that one company, the British India Company. This is why to this day, although it is, it is not well known, the official language of India is English. On a population basis, they have the second largest English speaking population in the world. And if you count people who speak English as a second language, it's number one in the world. And if you know anything about the history of India from the railroads to the university system, all of that influence was from, from Britain and the investors there. What about the Dutch East India Company? Well, by the year 1634, this company had become uh, the most valuable company to have ever existed with a market cap of 8.2 trillion with a T, making it the most valuable company of all time. And it had massive impacts all over Southeast Asia. And again, investors were probably not thinking about these impacts whenever they were making their investment decisions. So all around the world, uh, investing gains in power. And we shouldn't be surprised that abuse followed shortly thereafter. Um, this is something that Daniel Defoe uh, wrote about. Uh, many of you will know Defoe from uh, the book Robinson Crusoe, and he wrote about this in an essay in 1697, where he said this, investing has raised the fancies of credulous people to such a height that merely on the shadow of expectation, they formed companies, chose committees, appointed officers, shares, books, raised great stocks, and cried up an empty notion to that degree that people have been betrayed to part with their money for shares in a new nothing. And when the investors have carried on the jest till they've sold all their own interest, they leave and vanish into the cloud and leave the poor purchasers to quarrel with one another, to go to law about settlements, transferrings, and some bone or other thrown among them by the subtlety of the author to lay blame of the miscarriage upon themselves. Thus, the shares begin to fall by degrees and happy is he that sells in time till like brass money, it will go at last for nothing at all. And so we started to have abuse in, this, in the world of investing where people are essentially launching companies and selling stocks where there's really no substance behind it. You kind of get these shell companies and then they'll kind of pull out and take their, their, their earnings and leave everybody else to fight over the table scraps. And so what we have is a need for an ethical vision to be brought to the world of investing. And the person that would do that is a person named John Wesley. You may know the name. Um, he was an English minister in the 1700s who ended up founding the Methodist movement within Christianity. This is probably one of his most well-known quotes. Do all the good that you can by all the means that you can in all the ways you can 
in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Beautiful quote, one of my heroes. And he, he preached a sermon in 1759 entitled The Use of Money, where he actually speaks into this new fangled practice of investing. And this is a longer quote, but I want you to get a sense for his argument. And by the way, he's using very fiery language here, language we're not used to hearing, but hopefully you'll, you'll capture his argument well. We are thirdly to gain all we can without hurting our neighbor. But this we may not, cannot do if we love our neighbor as ourselves. We cannot, if we love everyone as ourselves, hurt anyone in his substance. Hereby, all pawnbroking is excluded. We are not allowed to do evil that good may come. Uh, back in the day, they were saying, well, what if, we, what if we invest in these companies, make a bunch of money, and then give that money away? Doesn't that make it right? And, and he's saying, no, the ends don't justify the means. He's trying to rebut that here. Neither, way, neither may we gain by hurting our neighbor in his body. Therefore, we may not sell anything that tends to impair health, such as eminently all that liquid fire, commonly called drams or spiritus liquors. Um, and, and what's the seller's gain? Is it not the blood of these men? A curse is in the midst of them. The curse of God cleaves to the stones, the timber, the furniture of them. He goes on. I'm gonna read you a little bit later in the quote. This is dear bought gain. And so is whatever is procured by hurting our neighbor in his soul, by ministering, suppose, either directly or indirectly to his unchastity or intemperance, which certainly none can do who has any fear of God or any real desire of pleasing him. And he, and he continues on. I'm going to skip ahead here. You can see here, if these profit the souls of men, you are clear. Your employment is good and your gain is innocent. But if they are either sinful in themselves or natural, endless to sin of various kinds, then it is to be feared you have a sad account to make. Oh, beware lest God say in that day, these have perished in their iniquity, but their blood do I require at thy hands. Wow, right? It's intense. But I hope that you were able to get a sense for what he's saying. He's saying that when we invest, it's not just about what we receive, which is the money. Our investments are having an impact on our neighbor, right? And so he's saying we need to engage with investing in a thoughtful, discerning way because every investment we, we make is shaping the world and impacting our neighbor. If we skip ahead to the modern day and just look at four of the big companies here, very familiar to those of you who are on the, in the Silicon Valley area, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Netflix. These companies have changed the world in dramatic ways, right? Just think about the number of hours that are logged in Netflix and YouTube watching content. YouTube reports that over 1 billion hours of video are streamed every single day. That is 114,000 years. Uh, incredible amount of, of influence in the world. Consider the way that social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have helped us form our opinions. In fact, I think they've fundamentally destabilized the news industry. And we now look to influencers for their opinions on what's happening out in the world. And guess what? All of these companies were funded by investors. It started with venture capital. It went on to uh, be released into the public markets and pushed higher in the stock exchanges. Impacts we often don't think about. Let me give you one more example from history. And this one I think is an amazing positive example of how investors have used money to shape the world in a positive way. So I'm gonna go back here a little bit to the year 1971 and you have a group of Christians who are concerned about apartheid. For those of you who may not remember all the details, I'll, I'll give you a, a refresher here. So apartheid, it is an Afrikaan word, it's a language in South Africa, uh, that means separation. It literally means aparthood or to keep separate. And it describes uh, a kind of institutionalized racial segregation where the black population was separated from the white population and treated in an inferior way. In, in this way, it was very much like uh, Jim Crow segregation within the US. So Christians are concerned about this at this time. And guess what? The politics lever isn't working. So the South African government had already ignored multiple United Nations sanctions and embargoes. So the, the pressure from government wasn't doing anything. What do you do, right? You're, you really care about this issue. You wanna make a difference and, and nothing is, is seeming to work. Well. A group of Christians had an idea. What if we become investors? 
So what they did is there was a group of Episcopals who invested in General Motors. General Motors is an automotive company that had operations in South Africa. And so what they did is they invested in GM and filed what is called a shareholder resolution. And this is a first of its kind event. So what they did is they enlisted the help of this person. This is Leon Sullivan, who was a black Baptist minister, someone who also cared a lot about apartheid. He grew up in a segregated US and was discriminated against. And so he carried that burden with him later in life. And when he heard about the plight of the black population in South Africa, he wanted to do something about it. So he works with these investors. They come up with what are called the Sullivan principles. And it was things like equal pay for equal work, uh, the same working conditions for blacks and whites, integrating restrooms and water fountains instead of separating them. And they proposed these principles to GM as a way to satisfy uh, these Christian investors. And so General Motors ends up adopting them. In fact, they brought Leon Sullivan onto the board of General Motors to oversee the project. Then guess what happens? The next, the next thing that happened was Ford and Goodyear, two other automotive companies with connections to South Africa, they change. And one by one, like dominoes, the culture begins to change. And it was because of these investors. In fact, historians look back on this and will say that one of the key instruments in the fall of apartheid, if not the key instrument, was actually this investor pressure. So amazing story of how ordinary investors with intention about how they use their money actually shaped the world and changed the world for millions. So how do we harness this power? That's where I wanna, wanna go in this presentation. Well, to succeed, we require a few things. Number one, intentionality. This is not gonna happen by accident. If we invest just in a traditional way, we'll be accessing a powerful mechanism in investing, but using it in a haphazard, <coughs> haphazard fashion. <coughs> so we have to be intentional. We gotta to work together. Any one of us with our individual IRA or 401k, it's too tiny to really make a difference. But if we work together, collective, collectivizing our efforts in a concerted fashion, we gain tremendous force. And finally, we need tools. We need investments that are designed to help us put these intentions into practice. My company is one such example. I know Matt works with, with many. I wanna now look at this intentionality in a, in a bit uh, closer way. So what, what do we mean by intentionality? Well, there's really three kinds. The first is to avoid companies with ethical concerns. So this is what John Wesley described, right? Companies whose practices and products are harming our neighbor. So we, we can avoid those. Next, embrace. We can seek out and embrace and invest in companies that are adding value to the world. And finally, engage. We can engage companies like the Episcopal shareholders did with General Motors. For the last part of my presentation, what I wanna do is I wanna give you now three short examples of, of contemporary ways that investors are putting their capital to work on important problems in the world. And it describes this embrace dimension. So the first one we're gonna talk about is clean energy. Let me read you some headlines. India's pollution today is as deadly as the black smog that covered Britain during the Industrial Revolution. New Delhi's gas chamber smog is so bad that United Airlines has stopped flying there. Breathing in Delhi, this is incredible here, breathing in Delhi air is equivalent to smoking 44 cigarettes a day. Oftentimes when we think about clean energy, our mind goes to the environment, right? Or to climate change. And we may, we may not always wholeheartedly agree with, with the initiative there. What I wanna do is I wanna show you the human side of, of pollution. These are a, a set of images. All of these show the smog problem in places uh, other than the US. So this is in India. This is also in India. This is in New Delhi. This is a famous arch there called the India Gate. This is in Beijing. And you can see this is a contrast of the same image on two different days. On the left, a heavy rain has cleared out the smog. On the right, this is what it looks like on a typical day. This is also in Beijing. This is the Forbidden City, Beijing. Here we can see people wearing masks, and this is not coronavirus. This picture was taken long before that. Um, this is a common practice in that part of the world to wear a mask on, on your everyday uh, journeys, even when there's no virus hanging around, because people are here are not trying to protect themselves from a virus. They're just trying to filter out the bad air and breathe something that's a bit cleaner. This is another one from Be Beijing here, the famous CCTV tower on the right. 
we don't often think about this, but pollution accounts for 16% of all premature deaths worldwide. You can see that's about uh, 9 million people due to pollution. You can see that it exceeds tobacco smoking, which is why they made that comparison between the air in New Delhi and 44 cigarettes a day. It affects your lungs primarily. And there are many health complications that come with that, including a lot of premature death. This is looking at the same data, this uh, mortality data, by uh, the income of countries and by the type of pollution. So you can see blue is air, air pollution. And you can see that it affects mainly the lower middle income countries. This is places like India and China. If we look at our own condition here in high income countries, you can see our air quality is comparable to places like rural Africa. We have great air. This is not a problem that we deal with. It is a huge problem in places like India and China. And why is that? It's because these countries are going through their industrial revolution right now, which is why the article uh, headline compared the, the black smog to that of Britain during the industrial revolution. Fortunately, we have a great solution to this problem. And I'm gonna read you a quote here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you by way of a poll, who you think said this? I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. I wish I had more years left. All right, who do you think said that? I'm gonna give you some choices on the screen here. So Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, Sheikh Ahmed Zaki Yamani, who is a Saudi oil minister, Al Gore, the former vice president, Thomas Edison, the inventor, or Jim Robo, CEO of a uh, clean tech energy company called NextEra Energy. What do you think? Good, I'm, thank you for participating. This is uh, nice to have some feedback instead of just me speaking out into the void here. All right, I think we have a good, a good Good group here. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So 29% um, of you said Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla. 71% said Thomas Edison, the inventor. It actually is Thomas Edison. So congratulations to you for guessing that. Thomas Edison, look at this. Back in 1931, what we're able to do today by taking the power of the sun or of the wind and converting that into usable clean energy um, it has been a dream of inventors for a very long time. And it's finally a reality. Uh, Thomas Edison longed to see the day that we're living in. And, you know, coronavirus has actually given us a glimpse of what's possible here. This is the same image I showed you earlier, which is of the India Gate in New Delhi, taken in November 2019. This is what uh, New Delhi looked like during the coronavirus economic slowdown, when, when all of the, the engines, primarily automobiles, were, were, were coming to a halt. Look at the change here. And this is what we're really investing to see accomplished, is that people would be able to breathe that kind of air and see that kind of sky. There are people in India who, during the, the shutdown, said they could see the Himalaya mountains for the first time in their life. They hadn't been seen for 30 years because of the smog. All right, let me give you another one. Water technology. This is a really exciting theme. So more than 2,000 children die every single day because of water-related illness. In fact, this is a low estimate. Unbelievable. I wanna give you some definitions here. These are good to know. What does it mean when, when we say that somebody has access to clean water? According to global standards, what that means is that every person in your house is able to get 20 liters of clean water every single day by going uh, within one kilometer radius of that location. Many of us don't really think in terms of liters, so how much is that? Well, the average American shower, one shower in a day, uses 65 liters. Here we're talking about 20, and not just for showering, but you can see for all, all domestic purposes, drinking, cooking, and personal hygiene. To calibrate yourself to this water problem, about a million people die each year due to diarrhea, due to water-related illness. 80% of these are children under the age of five, which is where the stat I showed you earlier came from. Dirty water is actually the second largest killer of children in the world. Number one is pneumonia. 
By the year 2025, how many people will not have access to water given the definitions we discussed? Almost a billion. 133 million people have what are called high intensity worm infections in their gut. I'll touch on this in a minute. Half the schools of the world do not have clean water, but an investment in this area yields a huge return for the world. So a dollar spent on clean water is estimated to generate almost $26 in return to society. This is counting all forms of return. So um, someone's not out from work because they're sick. They're not in the hospital. They're not sitting on the toilet with diarrhea. When you uh, give people clean water, it has a big return to society. This is our chief investment officer here, uh, Finney Curavella, with three of his eight children. They are in uh, Uganda. And Finney, before he uh, got into the world of investing, was a medical doctor. So he goes there for church reasons, but also conducts a, a deworming clinic. And you can see the lines here. These lines go on all day. There's no way they can possibly see everybody in the region. Everybody's got this. This is a, this little critter here is called Belharzia. You get it from drinking contaminated water. It lives in your gut. It lays eggs in your blood. It's excreted through your urine and feces and then goes back into the water system. So this is this huge problem that, that perpetuates itself. It's treatable, but not without striking at the root cause. You'll just get it again. Clean water is what's needed. In most of the world, water is considered women's work. You can see some women in Somalia here getting their family's water from rainwater runoff in a ditch, a woman in Mumbai getting the, the family water from train tracks. These are not sensational images, they're commonplace. And the reason that this is important that it's considered women's work is that if it's a school day and you have a, a son and a daughter, guess which one is going to skip school that day to get water for the family? It's gonna be the girl. This is one of the main reasons why women fall behind in their educational progress in the developing world. Certain parts of the world, it is reaching crisis levels. This is a well in Gujarat, India. Look at all the people that are trying to get their, their daily water here. And so frequent fights break out, two women fighting in Pune. And here's a quote, we face acute shortages of water, but water is available only two to three hours a day. Frequent fights, need to walk 20 to 30 minutes to fetch water, it is so humiliating. So as it turns out, the, the world has a ton of water. It's an access problem. Most of us know that uh, 90, about 97% of the world's water is in the ocean, so it's salt water. That leaves about 2.5% that's fresh. If we zoom in on that 2.5%, we can see most of it is in glaciers and ice caps, not helpful. Almost all the rest is underground, access. That leaves surface water. If we zoom into that, we can see that most of the surface water is in ice and snow. And here, finally, we get to surface water that's usable, rivers and lakes. But the rivers and lakes aren't where the people are in the major cities, and cities are, are, are targets for easy contamination. And so the world's got a lot of water. It's an access problem. And fortunately, it's very, very fixable. With simple water filtration technologies, such as it's shown here on the right, um, experts in the world of water will tell you that we could fix the world's access problem within one year of today, if we simply had the heart and capital to see it accomplished. So we were very interested in this theme as a company. And so we looked for a way to invest in a company that was, that was touching this problem. And we found an amazing company. So uh, the company receives about half of their revenue from North American water projects, 25% from Europe, but they're the leader in the developing world with 25% of their business there. They have a goal by 2025, to provide clean water to 20 million people living at the very base of the global economic pyramid. Pretty incredible to see this on the website of a publicly traded company. This is matched by substantial volunteering and donation, making it just an amazing company. And I think if our children wanted to go work for this company, we would send them off with our blessing. All right, last theme, a central nervous uh, system disorder. So this is an unmet need within healthcare. So, I want to ask you the last poll here. What is the disease schizophrenia? I give you uh, some descriptions of diseases. What do we know about this disease schizophrenia? If you were to try to describe it, I'll let you read this. There's a little, little, few words here.
Good. You guys are taking part in this. The disease schizophrenia. What do we know about it? Okay, I'm going to call it done here. Share the results. So 60% of you uh, characterized it as symptoms such as uh, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and limited emotions. 40% of you uh, said that it was a delusional disorder known for exaggerated fears of unlikely events. You know, a lot of people that I, that I talk to will often say multiple personality disorder. And the reason for that is we have this expression, oh, don't be schizophrenic. Maybe you've heard that. And what, what we mean by that is don't be one person one minute and then a completely different person the next. Don't, don't switch personalities. Uh, but that's a separate diagnosis. So, so what is schizophrenia? I'll, sh I'll show you what the right answer is here. So it's known by its symptoms. And there are what are called positive symptoms. Positive doesn't mean good. It means expressed. And negative symptoms, repressed. <clears throat> so the correct answer was that set of symptoms characterized by delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. And the hallmarks are delusions and hallucinations. So people will see things and they will hear things. So they'll, they'll hear the wall talking to them and often telling them to do something very dark. They'll have disorganized speech. It's hard to understand them. They'll have what's called a flat effect, which is uh, they, they lack a wide emotional range like you and I have. They will speak less and they will lack initiative. They just cannot get motivated. As you think about this disease, I wonder if anyone came to mind. Where in our everyday comings and goings have we encountered people with schizophrenia? If your mind goes to the homeless, you're correct. Schizophrenia is one of the top three drivers for why people become homeless even in the first place. And it affects a lot more people than we think. Three million Americans, that's about 1% of the population. The treatments that we have for schizophrenia are ancient and horrible. So the last approved therapy for schizophrenia was the year 1952, 52, this is ancient medicine. And the, the benefits are very limited with horrific side effects. And so people don't stay on the medicine, they go off and then they're unmedicated. And the World Health Organization ranks it as the third most debilitating disease in the world. It's a big, big problem that exists in the world and something that would love to be able to address, right? If you could address schizophrenia, you could fundamentally address a problem like homelessness. So we've been very interested in this space for a while and a company came to us that we had invested in in the past and they said, I think we have a way to address schizophrenia. And they proposed all the medical literature and laid out their proposed therapy. And we do a lot of healthcare investing. And so we looked at it very carefully and decided that, hey, this has got a good shot. So we invested while the company was still private. We do a little bit of private investing. And what we were waiting to see was the results of a clinical trial. So what they did was, they took a group of patients with schizophrenia and they divided them in half and they gave half of the, the people with a placebo, which is nothing. It's a blank pill. The other half, they gave this new proposed therapy. They admitted them, them to the hospital and then they monitored them over five weeks. You can see baseline is day zero up to five weeks. And what do you want to see? You want to see a reduction in the symptoms for this proposed therapy. And the way that they measure that is something called a PANS score, which sounds really confusing, but it stands for positive and negative symptom score. So I showed you what the positive and negative symptoms were. So what, what you're looking for are just how many symptoms, how severe, and you want to see that go down. So the black line shows you what happened with, with the placebo. You can see it actually got a little bit better which may seem strange, but this was actually expected because it's such a debilitating disease that being in a carefully monitored uh, and cared for environment like a hospital where you get regular meals and care, it actually improves symptoms. The blue, however, shows you what happened with the active drug. And you can see they got a, a, about a 15 point improvement in this PAN score, which clinicians will tell you is a complete game changer. This fundamentally changes the life of somebody with schizophrenia. So we were really, really encouraged by this. But what about side effects, right? Um, as I told you, the last medicine had horrible side effects. The way that you, you look at this is you wonder, you ask how many people are saying, get me out of here to the study and leaving the study. So 20% of the patients discontinued the study that were on the drug. 
21% that were on the placebo. So no difference there. So this means that the side effects must be really, really mild. So this is huge, huge, huge. We now have a new breakthrough in the world of schizophrenia. The company is entering a phase three clin clinical trial and if they receive approval, I think this is gonna have an enormous impact on the world. At my company, we call this investing that makes the world rejoice. And we really believe this, that the way we, can invest, the way we invest can benefit us by growing our money, but it can also positively benefit the world when we do it with intention. Let me leave you with a final quote. This is from the sociologist I opened up with, James Davison Hunter. Most of us are inclined to what has been called the great man or the great person view of history. That the history of the world is but the biography of great men. The only problem with this perspective is that it is mostly wrong. Against this great man view of history and culture, I would argue along with many others that the key actor in history is not the individual genius, but rather the network. One of the reasons why I'm so excited to be sharing uh, this with you is that I have an interest in building more awareness and to, to build a coalition really of investors that want to use their capital for their own families, but also for the sake of the world. And so thank you for those of you that are investing alongside of us with, with Matt. And uh, for those of you that are new to this concept, will you consider joining us? And with that, I'm going to welcome back Matt onto the call and we are uh, now gonna move into a time where we can take some questions. Wow, uh, Jason, that was awesome. Uh, I actually learned so much. And, um, you know, I actually had no idea, even though I've been working with you guys for quite some time now, that you were working on problems in our society like schizophrenia. So that's just pretty amazing. Um, yeah, definitely, I want to open it up to Q&A at this time. And uh, definitely want to let people strike while the iron is hot, so to speak. Any questions they might have. And we did have a couple come in through the chat. So maybe I can just start with those. Um, one question was, uh, how would you recommend using my high student loan debt uh, to work for God's glory when working hourly in healthcare to get out of debt as soon as possible without feeling broke slash not having the ability to go out and travel post COVID, obviously? Um, yeah, that's a great question. How do you get started with investing when, you know, you've got a mountain of debt sitting, sitting in front of you? I know a lot of uh, young people are in that position because of uh, the high cost of college these days. Um, and I think um, you, need, you need a budget if you're going to get out of debt successfully. Um, obviously, you know, I love Dave Ramsey, the way he talks about it. You got two, two solutions. You can either reduce your expenses or you can increase your income. You know, so I think, you know, you should work on doing both of those, obviously finding a higher paid job, using that education to increase your income, but also living uh, well within your means, uh, sticking to a tight budget and uh, just really being disciplined to get, at, get out, to, to get out of debt is uh, you need a lot of discipline. And um, there will be a time for investing, but I would definitely encourage uh, you to get out of debt first uh, and just to be really tenacious about that. And then uh, once you're debt free, then you can start working your way towards, um, you know, building wealth and doing so in a way that brings, brings God glory and also uh, really brings benefit to the world around you. And I'd be happy to help um, put you on, um, uh, a good game plan that will kind of see you through that. Uh, so reach out to me if uh, you need some help there. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just maybe add one little thing. So I, I lived with a guy who was in your same position. Uh, so he, he had accumulated a lot of student debt. He was on, was on the, the order of about $110,000. He was in the hole. And he had just begun a career in nursing. And so he, he was talking to me about what am I going to do? And and we, we created one of those game plans. So work with Matt on that. What he ended up doing is just getting really focused on paying down that debt. And he actually, uh, for a brief period of time, actually went and did travel nursing because of a, a pay benefit when, by going to another city. And because of this, he was able to experience some of the great cities around the US. He is now out of debt in just a, just a few years. He, he was able to pay all that down. And is, is now he, he bought his last car with cash and has saved up a lot of money for a down payment on a home. So it's, it's totally doable. 
but you got to get serious about it. And, and I know Matt could be a, a great help there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's so many great success stories there. It doesn't have to take a long time, but like Jason said, you do have to get serious about it. That has to be your, your top priority. And um, there's some good, you know, strategies uh, to ha how to tackle it. So let's talk. Okay, so we have another question. Um, did you mention the name of the water company? Sorry, I didn't catch it. No, I didn't. Uh, from, from a compliance perspective, we're not allowed to mention the names of companies because we don't want to propose any sort of an investment recommendation, right, to buy or sell. That so we just wanted to present the concept of that. Um, you know, the uh, water technology is, is something that is, that is a growing space not for impact reasons even, but because of things like we have aging water infrastructure in the US, a lot of water leaks into the ground. So a lot of companies are addressing this through new technology with water meters and upgraded infrastructure and efficiency pumps and all those sorts of things. So this is a, this is a big, a, a big you know, well-established water company that just so happens to be the world leader in the developing world and has a, has a desire to grow in that direction. So unfortunately, I can't tell you the name of the company, but um, just wanted to present you with the idea uh, behind it. Very cool. Thanks, Jason. Um, uh, we got to thank you for a very enlightening presentation. Good. Uh, and then we have, uh, we like the history and background of the different companies involved in making the world rejoice. So that's yeah, you know, I think that's where it becomes real to people. You, know, you can hear about the theory, but there are just some amazing stories. And I wish we had time to go through uh, more of them because you, they come one right after another. And I think a lot of times we have this perception that business is kind of a bad thing and we, we need to kind of pinch our nose when we enter into the world of investing. And there are some, some examples out there. I know one of the things that Matt helps clients to do is avoid some of those problem areas. But there's also some really shining examples of business. And I, I, I believe personally, for faith reasons, that, that business is actually meant to be a servant to society and that human beings are supposed to channel their creativity into creating products and services that are good. In fact, we call the products of business goods and services, right? Why do we do that? Because their products are supposed to be good and a <laughs> service to humanity. That's really where we get the origin of that from. So um, we are very pro-business and we are excited to seek out these companies that you can really be excited and proud to own. Awesome. Sweet. Well, I got a couple questions for you, Jason. Sure. All right. So um, one was, I typically, when I think of mutual funds, uh, mutual fund companies investing in other companies, I think publicly traded. Uh, but you mentioned uh, in the presentation that Eventide actually fun does some funding of private companies. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and maybe even how rare or common that would that that is for a fund company to do? Yeah, it's it's pretty rare. Uh, so the mutual fund, the mutual fund. In case those of you like who don't know the details here, a mutual fund is just an investment vehicle. It's a t it's a way to invest, and it's called a pooled investment vehicle where many investors put in their money together, and then a portfolio takes that money and invests it in companies, and then and then all those investors will share in that portfolio of companies and mutual funds generally in most cases will just be investing in publicly traded companies but they do have the ability uh, according to the sec rules to invest a small percentage in private companies up to 15 percent and so we work well under that limit there's some strict rules around that so we're probably about half that last year we did um, about 150 million in investments across 27 investments into private companies. And most of those are in the healthcare space, like the schizophrenia example I shared. We really like that philosophically because what that means is that if we have an investor in one of our funds, they're, they're participating in this, which means their dollars went right into the balance sheet of the company. So it didn't go to some other shareholder on the stock exchange who owned the shares before them. It went right into the company, which means that our investors actually funded that clinical work to seek that approval for schizophrenia. So in that way, their dollars are the, are the reason that that impact is being made in the world. And so to the extent that we're able to do that, obviously you gotta be really selective and it's a very high risk, uh, high reward proposition often. So we enter that really uh, carefully with a lot of thought, 
but we love it philosophically because we're able to put our money directly into businesses and help them to grow. Awesome. Um, one more question. Could you maybe tell us um, in, in layman's terms, um, for those that don't know some of the technical sure. uh, lingo behind mutual fund talk, but Eventide has come out with a few new funds in just the last year or two. Uh, could you just give us maybe like a high level of um, what those funds are all about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we started Eventide uh, about a dozen years ago, back in uh, 2008, with this vision of investing that makes the world rejoice. We, we looked at the world of investing and we felt like people in general had forgotten about that connection to business whenever they invest. They kind of invest, they think of it as like kind of putting it into the market and not really thinking about individual businesses and what those businesses are doing in the world. And we said, man, what an opportunity to create investments where people could express a desire to grow their own money, but also to uh, impact the world and be a blessing in the world. And so we started with one fund and we now have seven. And uh, there's, a, there's a whole range of them from ones that are sort of geared towards high long-term growth to ones that are a bit more balanced between growth and income to ones that are purely on the, in, on the current income generation side of things. And so, yeah, you, you'd be able to kind of see the range of offerings there. But generally what we're trying to do is, is look at all of the needs that investors have and provide an investing that makes the world rejoice solution for all of those variety of needs. So if you're looking to grow your money and you're young, we, we, you know, we're, we're trying to give you investments for that. If you're in retirement and you need income but still want the philosophy, we've got solutions now for that. And in general, we hope to build out a, a, a large uh, suite of funds that allow you to kind of express this desire in the way that you invest. Great. Yeah, that was awesome. Well, we do have about eight minutes left. Um, if anybody else has a question, uh, please uh, go ahead and put it in the comments uh, box there. Otherwise, we can wrap this up and let you get back on with your, your work day. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go through my, my outro here. Um, I just want to thank everybody so much for joining us uh, for the power of investing to change the world. Uh, I hope this has been uh, really beneficial for all of us. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule uh, to engage with us on the important issues of our time and to learn how we can actually do something about it through our investments. Um, as always, I'm available to talk uh, about your financial circumstances by appointment. So uh, if you'd like to schedule that, please reach out to me by phone, email, or direct message on social media. Um, if you want to watch this presentation again or share it with a friend, um, it has been recorded, as Jason said, so I'll be emailing the replay out shortly. And in closing, um, some of you here today um, are already invested with Eventide funds, but others are not. So for those that are not, I wanna bring Jason on one last time and just ask for his last closing words. Jason, with all of the great fund companies out there uh, that you could be working for, uh, can you tell us why you uh, continue to work for Eventide funds? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, won't, I won't give you the, the shameless self-promotion here, but what I hope that I was able to do is, is to get you thinking about what's happening behind the account statements. And it is a world, I think, filled with ethical perils. I think we can end up investing in things that we would be greatly dismayed to discover, but it's also a world of tremendous opportunity. And if you're the kind of person who wants to use your life and money in a strategic way, for example, if you're a believer and want to not only invest for your needs, but to be a blessing to your neighbor and to the world. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a great thing to look into. And Matt's really built a business around this. So talk to him and he will, he will help you explore these topics further. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Really, really appreciate your time. And um, I think that's all we've got for today. So uh, God bless and uh, we will see everybody on the next one. Thank you. Take care.